In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together, and suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as a fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues, as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Thus we read in the first reading of today's Mass, the Mass of the day. There's always a vigil Mass as well. Like all the great solemnities that our Holy Mother, the Church, offers us for our celebration, for our enlightenment, this solemnity began with a vigil Mass. But in the Mass of today, this is the first reading for cycle A, which we are now. And it brings us right smack to the very center of the mystery that we're celebrating, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my brothers and sisters, it's been a long, shall we say, process. Breaking into light from the 40 days of Lent, in which we commemorated the, more than commemorate, we follow the path of the chosen people in their pilgrimage through the Sinai Peninsula to finally reach the Promised Land through practices of penance, enable, in order to enable that work of redemption in our soul, of conversion rather. Until we arrive at Holy Week, where we relive the passion and the death. And Easter, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. These past days, seven weeks, which we had referred to as the Falcian days of Easter. When accompanying the apostles, we listened once more, we reviewed once more, we savored once more the events of Holy Week and what followed afterwards. When our Lord appeared to them many times in his glorious resurrected body, talking to them in multis argumentis, in many ways, opening their hearts and their minds to the fullness of revelation, so that they understood finally how the events of Holy Week were a fulfillment of what had been prophesied in Scripture. And so finally now we arrive at Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, when those men, erstwhile disciples of our Lord, are finally constituted into full-time apostles. On Ascension Day last week, they had already received the mission, the mandate, to go and preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But they were still afraid. They were still, shall we say, overwhelmed with the circumstances the, the Roman Empire, the persecution by the Sanhedrin and their fellow Jews. And so for the most part, they were still there. Not powering in fear, actually, but yes, is staying among themselves in the relative security and comfort of like-minded individuals, 
who had believed and our Lord who believed in Jesus Christ. My Lord would finally confirm them in their path as intrepid apostles would be the events of today, of this day, of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit descended upon them in tongues of fire that parted and settled on each one of their heads, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, the apostles and Mary, because they were around Mary. Perhaps even the holy women who were there accompanying them in the upper room or wherever they were at that moment. And that was the beginning of the church. St. Jose Maria, meditating on this passage and preaching about it, would say, the solemn coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was not an isolated event. There is hardly a page in the Acts of the Apostles where we fail to read about him and the actions by which he guided, directed, and enlivened the life and work of the early Christian community. It is he who inspired the preaching of St. Peter, who strengthened the faith of the disciples, who confirmed with his presence the calling of the Gentiles, who sent Saul and Barnabas to the distant lands where they will open new paths for the teaching of Jesus. In a word, his presence and doctrine was everywhere. Well, Pentecost continues. The Holy Spirit lives in the church. Let's take into the literal sense, first of all, of that Pentecost Sunday. Or that it was not a Sunday, by the way, because 50 days after Easter Sunday could be a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At this sound, they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So there was a thunderous sound and wind strong enough for the people around to notice it. And so they gathered around where the apostles and Mary were. And they were astonished because they heard them speaking to them in their own tongue. This is the real speaking in tongues. Not speaking in gibberish. Things that couldn't be understood. On the contrary, what amazed those Jews, the proselytes coming from every country under the sun, the St. Luke says, in a bit of exaggeration, of course, but still. And each one of them understood them, heard them speaking in their own language, and they noticed it. It's not as if, you know, they were in a trance and they understood conceptually what was being said. No, they were aware that they were speaking in their own tongue. You know, sometimes when you speak different languages, it, it, it's an act of reflection to realize what the language that you are hearing is because it enters not through, you're not, meaning to say, you're not so conscious of the physicality of the sounds but rather you get the concepts immediately that they represent. So it's an act of reflection. It's a second thought for you to realize that that's how that person was speaking in, in English or in French or in Spanish or in Italian or in Portuguese or in Tagalog because the concepts just came in first. Well, here it's stated categorically by the evangelist, by St. Luke, that each one of them heard they were conscious that they were being spoken to in their mother tongue. Now let's segue to the spiritual sense. The apostles, because of the coming of the Holy Spirit, have become intrepid, or the disciples, rather, have become intrepid apostles, ministers, evangelizers. And from the first moment, they started preaching. Here it says that uh, 
Peter would deliver a, a lecture, a, a, a discourse, summarizing what had happened in the past two years, the public ministry of our Lord, summarizing the events of salvation history, such that his listeners, not only the, the Jews, but also all of those other who were there, especially the Jews who had come from the diaspora, would be converted to Christianity. On that day, 3,000 people were baptized. 3,000. No, that's not a mean number, considering the populations of that time. And St. Cosamaria continues, the profound reality which we see in the text of Holy Scripture is not a remembrance from the past, from some golden age of the church, which has since been buried in history. Despite the weaknesses and the sins of every one of us, it is the reality of today's church and the church of all times. I will ask the Father, our Lord told his disciples, and he will give you another counselor to dwell with you forever. Jesus has kept his promise. He has risen from the dead and in union with the eternal Father, he sends us the Holy Spirit to sanctify us and to give us life. The strength and power of God lights up the face of the earth. The Holy Spirit is present in the Church of Christ for all time, so that it may be always and in everything a sign raised up before all nations. That's what the Church is. Ecclesia, coming from the Greek ecclesiain, which means to assemble, to gather, to invoke. Because the church is not formed by men and women who have banded themselves together in order to do a great thing. That's a great thing, but it's not enough. The church, like the people of God of the Old Testament, was then the people who, 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 who thought themselves as special and started doing something great. Remember, before they became a people, there was just Abraham and his family who were called out of the misery of war. Yes, despite the civilization that uh, Iraq at that time stood for, it was miserable because of fallen nature, because of paganism, because of the denaturation of the natural law that's the consequence of sin. They were called out of that misery in order to constitute a people convoked by God, that was the old ecclesia, that was the old assembly, that was the old people of God, which had segued in time with the coming of Jesus Christ and his passion and death on the cross into the new people of God, which is the church. Washed by the waters of baptism, symbolically, but really, and imbued with the Holy Spirit who descends and infuses himself, infuses that soul rather, like the first time that the breath of God or the Holy Spirit was breathed into Adam and Eve in paradise. And that assembly of people, each one of them with the Spirit, as an assembly is also shall we say, informed by that same spirit. You will recall that in the Old Testament, in Genesis rather, chapter 1, the creation of the, the universe for the first time. And it says there that the spirit of God was moving over the waters, managing creation. Well, mutatis mutandis, in this new creation, which is the constitution of the church, the spirit of God continues to move. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. Nothing happens in the church which is out of his purview. If the Spirit of God would be moving over the waters the mater of the material universe, can you imagine that? God deigns to bother himself with providing for the material universe. What more for the spiritual creatures? What more for man?
The second reading is a follow-up to this idea, this time taken from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Remember calling that, calling that important uh, city in Macedonia, in that Corinth, uh, or in Greece, rather. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts but the same Spirit. There are different forms of service but the same Lord. There are different workings but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. As a body is one through, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. My brothers and sisters, let's never lose track of our identity. Now there's a saying in Tagalog, magpakatotoo ka. Hmm? Be yourself. But not ourselves, that persona that we had imagined or that we had concocted for ourselves. But that persona which God made us to be. And again, we go back to that uh, uh, initial revelation which was followed up later by St. Paul. God made man, we read in Genesis chapter 1, to his image and likeness. To his image and likeness he made, made him. Male and female he made them. Just two sexes. And so therefore two genders, two behavioral patterns that follow those two sexes, masculine and feminine. And in chapter 2, we read that God made man from the slime of the earth and breathed into his nostrils his own breath, which gave us supernatural life. Not that we were dead. We were alive biologically. Not that we were zombies. We were alive spiritually too because we have a spirit with intellect and will. But with the infusion of the Holy Spirit, the human person with his intellect and his will is elevated to share in the nature of God. And so therefore, in the intimate life of the Blessed Trinity, that is our destiny. And because that was lost because of the free act of our first parents, God found a remedy for that too. Even before the constitution of the world, even before the Big Bang, it was already in the mind of the Blessed Trinity, how he was going to remedy that situation. Because, and this time we read from St. Paul, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and spotless in his presence in love. And that's why, my brothers and sisters, we can never get tired. And I will never get tired of reminding you of this fundamental reality by which you should live. God chose you to be holy and spotless in his presence in love. But he is going to be the one to do that work. And we just have to second the motion. The apostles did not volunteer. God chose them. And even after Jesus had taught them, it took them quite a while to get on board, so to speak. Because that's how we are. We're all a bunch of jokers. Even when God has taken the initiative, even when we have been baptized, we realize that we flip-flop. That's why the work of the Holy Spirit is ongoing. The entrance antiphon of today's Mass brings us to the right, shall we say, um, attitude when it says, The Spirit of the Lord has filled the whole world, and that which contains all things understands what he said, Alleluia. And after the initial uh, confession of sins, the Confitia and the Kyria eleison, then the collect sums it up immediately when it says, O oh God, 
who by the mystery of today's great feast sanctify your whole church and every people and nation, pour out, we pray, the gifts of the Holy Spirit across the face of the earth. And with the divine grace that was at work when the gospel was first proclaimed, fill now once more the hearts of believers through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, the Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the holy unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Every time we see prayers like this, especially in the collect, we have to realize that what we're praying for is not something that God will do will do because we're praying for it. Every time you look at the prayers of the collect, and it's always something that you see is really what God wants. Let the Holy Spirit be active in His church. That the sevenfold gift be um, poured in abundance. But that's what he wants. That's what he's trying to do. So when we pray in the collect, what we're actually doing is not so much asking God to do something, but disposing ourselves to allow God to do that thing. And then you realize that if we're asking him to do that, in other words, disposing ourselves for him to do that, in other words, be coming on board. It was because of the action of the Holy Spirit himself in our soul. We can't even pray for the right thing without the Holy Spirit taking the initiative and we just getting on board. So we're getting on board his intention for us to get on board. I don't know if 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 you understand this. Or as the black guy would say, if you feel me. But that's what's happening here. It's always God's initiative. And since we flip-flop, then we must have a way of, shall we say, getting back into the program. And that's where the gospel passage um, shall we say, mm, yeah. encapsulates the whole idea because we read a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John this time. On the evening of that first day of the week, Easter Sunday, when the doors were locked where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. We had just been meditating on this passage several times, as a matter of fact, these past weeks. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. And I'd like to end this prayer with these considerations on this day of Pentecost with this particular, shall we say, verse. The our Lord was not speaking idly. If he appeared to the disciples, his disciples, on that fateful evening of Easter, a Sunday, the first Easter Sunday, it was in order to give them peace. Because they were troubled, they were perturbed, they were in a heightened state of anxiety. That's why they were all there cowering in the upper room. The doors locked for fear of the Jews. And the resurrected Christ with his glorious body, of course, went through that door and just appeared in the midst of them. And the first thing he says, peace be with you. Oh my Lord. You are the God of peace. You are the Lord of peace. You are the Prince of peace. If anything robs us of peace, it's not from the Lord. If something bothers you from it and eats at your soul from the inside, it's not from the Lord. It's the devil who always troubles us, who robs us of the clarity of vision, and then makes us flee from the real solution. 
And the real solution is what our Lord says here. Receive the Holy Spirit. But then it says, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you, sins you retain are retained. What is he talking about? He doesn't take rocket science to realize what he was talking about. He was instituting the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of penance, of confession. Peace be with you. But in order for that to happen, receive the Holy Spirit, whose whatever sins you forgive are forgiven, whatever sins you retain are retained. Who Benedict, commenting on that passage of the Last Supper, of the washing of the feet. In his usual masterful way. Interprets it to mean that, you know, that, that dialogue, remember, when St. Peter said, you will never wash my feet. It's the attitude of people who don't want to go to confession. Who don't want to uh, apply the means. Who limit going to confession to when they have mortal sins. You will never wash my feet. And our Lord said, if I do not wash your feet, if I do not wash you, in other words, if I do not mean you, you will have no part of me. And Peter immediately changes gears. Not only my feet, but also my head and my hands. And then our Lord says something very mysterious, which Pope Benedict dwells at length. Because our Lord said, uh, you are already clean. And so you do not need to be washed head and hands, just your feet. And again, in a masterful way, the scholar that he is, Pope Benedict came up with an, um, an interpretation. And according to him, of course, our Lord took for granted that they had already bathed before coming to that dinner, to that supper. Not only the ritual washing, but, you know. And so they were clean. And the only thing that would be dirted would be their feet because of the dust of walking from where they were. And that was what he needed to clean. And then he segues with the spiritual sense that we too have been cleaned, cleansed by the waters of baptism. But we get dirt along the way. We get dust in our feet along the way. And in the course of a lifetime, there will be many venial sins and for not to say mortal sins. And that's what needs to be cleaned by the waters of confession, by the waters of the sacrament that Jesus Christ instituted in this very passage that we are commenting on of the Last Supper. Because it was necessary. My brothers and sisters, we're ending the great season of Lent and Easter today. We have gone through a whole process of penance, which we said is just habitual contrition, of rebirth because of the Paschal mystery on Easter Sunday. We had cemented our ideas of that conversion through these halcyon days of Easter. Now we have to go back to ordinary things. You have already made, made you have already been made, you have already been made clean by the waters of baptism. But we have a long stretch ahead. Conversion is a task of a moment, but sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And in that lifetime work, always with the initiative and the providence of the Holy Spirit, actually of the Blessed Trinity dwelling in our soul in grace, we will get dust along the way. We will get bruised along the path, this winding, long winding path towards heaven. May we know how to apply the means. Confession. Frequent. How frequent? I go to confession every week. I know many people who do, who 
who, who do the same thing. Not because they're especially sinful, but yes, because we are all sinful. Communion, prepared by a good confession. Communion, which is a sacrament in order to enable us to become one with Christ. Not by converting him to us, but by he converting us to him. You want to be God-like? Then be sacramentally united to our Lord Jesus Christ. And like that, with these means that we have, with these sacraments that we have, then we're going to um, um, follow the path that has been traced by our Lord, and we will continue with the adventures of ordinary life, the great adventure of our sanctification, which has been paid for by a very steep price, but which we now should enjoy to the full, with the fullness of life of the children of God, the fullness of life that the Holy Spirit gives. Spend a few moments congratulating your resolutions from this prayer. 